Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, it's time for us to go ahead and start uh, this uh, panel on Asia's new security order and the role of the ROK Japan US relationship. Uh, my name is Scott Snyder. I'm a senior fellow for Korea Studies uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, and uh, we're grateful for the Jeju Peace Forum for. Um, uh, this opportunity, but I also want to acknowledge that this particular panel uh, has been put together by the Korea Foundation and the Mike and Maureen Mansfield Foundation, uh, and it uh, includes uh, scholars who uh, have been uh, here in Korea over the course of the past week uh, as part of a project uh, uh, focusing on emerging leaders uh, and looking at uh, issues uh, in uh, U.S. relations with Korea and with Japan. Uh, and so we've got some really, I think, uh, good people. Um, and uh, I'll introduce them momentarily, but I just want to say one or two words to set the framework for this panel from a U.S. perspective. And I think the best way for me to do that is to simply note that um, over the course of the past uh, year or so, uh, the U.S. government uh, has definitely made it a priority uh, to support and promote uh, trilateral cooperation uh, among the U.S., Japan, and South Korea. Uh, and I think that that is most clearly uh, expressed uh, in a uh, speech uh, that was given by the U.S. Under Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, uh, a few months ago at the Brookings Institution, uh, where he stated uh, that the U.S. was seeking a trilateralism among the U.S., Japan, and South Korea that was, one, strategic in value, two, complementary in nature, uh, and three, global in scope. And so I think that to some degree, what we may be doing in this panel is trying to tease out and explore what that means what that means uh, in the context of uh, Northeast Asian security challenges. And we've got uh, an excellent uh, set of uh, panelists to help us do that. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time to introduce them, but I am going to um, uh, at least um, uh, acknowledge and, 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 and introduce them rather than giving a lot of background uh, in the order uh, that they are going to present. Uh, and so on the far end, we have uh, Andrew Yaw, uh, Associate Professor of Politics uh, at the Catholic University of America uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, next to him uh, is Weston Kunishi, uh, the William Reinch Visiting Lecturer of East Asian Studies uh, at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and then um, uh, Shihoko Goto, Senior Associate for Northeast Asia at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars. Uh, and then our West Coast representative, uh, Ellen Kim, who um, is um, uh, at uh, USC, but also is an associate uh, of the Center for Strategic International Studies. And so um, rather than saying anything more, I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Andrew. Each of the uh, panelists are going to give about five minutes from various perspectives looking at this issue of trilateralism. Uh, and then we'll open up for a broader conversation. So, uh, Andrew, please start us off. Well, thank you so much for those opening comments, Scott. And I also want to thank the Jeju Forum for organizing this wonderful uh, event, but also the Korea Foundation and the Mansfield Foundation for helping put us together on this panel. Um, my job here is really to lay out the context of U.S.-Japan-Korea relations within the broader uh, uh, Asian regional order, and my colleagues will uh, provide more specifics, but uh, there's really three points that I want to make in my comments. The first, uh, well, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about uh, Asia's institutional over order, just give a brief overview of that, what that order looks like. Um, second, I'm going to talk about how the United States has been giving uh, greater support for uh, this institutional order in recent years. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about the relevance of U.S.-Japan-Korea relations uh, under this context. Okay, so Asia's institutional order is, is quite interesting because in the, in the early 1990s, uh, at the end of the Cold War, there were a lot of comments uh, about Asia, comparing it to Europe, uh, arguing that Asia was under-institutionalized, that there, aren't, there isn't a NATO, there isn't a European 
uh, union equivalent to uh, within East Asia. And so Asia was defined as being under-institutionalized. Um, but if we fast forward and look at the institutional uh, architecture today, um, there's plenty of, uh, there are plenty of institutions out there. And I would argue that today, the institutional order is characterized by overlapping institutions. And there's a term that uh, Professor Victor Cha uses, he refers to it as a complex patchwork, where you have overlapping bilateral, uh, trilateral, uh, minilateral, and multilateral institutions um, layered on top of one another. So this is what uh, East Asia's institutional order looks like in the 21st century. Now, the U.S. has been providing support uh, to this regional order, or I'll, I'll sometimes refer to it as regional architecture, and they've been uh, providing a sport going beyond the traditional hub and spokes, the traditional bilateral alliance system that, uh, that Washington had relied on during the Cold War. And, uh, and this, is a, this is a shift in, in thinking because in the early 1990s, the U.S. was reluctant to uh, engage in some of the uh, negotiations involving uh, uh, different multilateral initiatives. But under the Obama administration, um, you saw the United States reaching out to ASEAN. Uh, they, uh, they signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which allowed them uh, in 2011 to then join the East Asia Summit. Today, uh, Washington wants to use this East Asia, East Asia Summit as uh, the premier uh, form or the premier mechanism for uh, discussing uh, security and political issues within the region. And we also see the United States uh, encouraging its own allies to uh, expand uh, its network. Uh, so it's not just about uh, the hub and spokes. Uh, so for instance, it's not just about US-Japan, US-Korea, US-Philippines, but they're encouraging ties within, uh, within the spokes. So uh, there's, there's been a greater cooperation between Philippine and Japan, uh, between uh, Japan and Korea, between Australia and Japan. And they've also been encouraging or trying to encourage uh, different trilateral arrangements. So we have uh, U.S.-Australia-Japan relations, and of course the topic for today, uh, U.S.-Japan-Korea relations. So what is the relevance of U.S.-Japan-Korea relations in this broader regional architecture? So it's, it's almost obvious that these three countries should come together. They both, uh, both Korea and Japan host a significant number of U.S. troops. Uh, they're, both, uh, uh, they're both democracies. And for the U.S., it would be, I mean, this is one of the reasons why the U.S. has been uh, pushing really hard uh, to strengthen uh, U.S.-Japan-Korea relations for, for the last 15 years. And of course, as we know, it hasn't always uh, moved in that direction because there's been tensions between Japan and Korea. But even um, if we look back at uh, Japan-Korea relations uh, two or three years ago when the relationship was very rocky, you saw the United States, I mean, the, uh, wa officials in Washington were very frustrated about the situation. But at the same time, uh, behind the scenes, they were really trying to, to, push to, uh, to push the Koreans, to push the Japanese to um, improve their relationship so that they can uh, strengthen uh, trilateralism. And of course, uh, functionally, I mean, this makes sense. When you have uh, issues like uh, North Korea uh, nuclear proliferation on the table, I mean, if you would really want these three countries, these three allied countries, to be able to coordinate their policy, uh, to share information. And of course, the, the elephant in the room is uh, relations with, with China and how US, Japan, Korea uh, relations uh, play into questions about, uh, broader questions about regional order and l the legitimacy of the liberal international order. I'm not going to say too much because um, Ellen Kim will be talking more specifically about that. But in sum, I think uh, having, uh, you know, for, the, for Washington, Seoul, and, and Tokyo to be able to uh, strengthen this relationship, it does signal to the, uh, the region, but all, not only the region, but the global community that um, the liberal international order is really the direction uh, this is this is the type of order that that we would want to see. Um, so I think I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Weston. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
and you set a nice precedent for being very brief, and I'll be very brief as well because I know I'm just, we're just setting it up for our two colleagues here. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'd like to just give a few words about uh, the state of uh, the current US ROK Japan trilateral uh, cooperation, particularly in the, in the defense realm. Uh, my overall assessment of the trilateral um, relationship is that it's pretty much on the upswing. Um, there has been, um, you know, uh, many years of trilateral cooperation beginning in the 90s with the Trilateral Cooperation Oversight Group, TCOG, as it was otherwise known. Uh, and there's been ongoing dialogue amongst the three countries since then. Um, and more recently, in December of 2014, the three countries agreed to the Trilateral Information Sharing Agreement, uh, which was meant to um, improve the sharing of intelligence information, uh, particularly uh, addressing North Korea nuclear and um, missile um, threats. And, um, and it was just announced that the three sides will engage in joint uh, missile defense exercises uh, on the outskirts of the so-called uh, RIMPAC exercises in Hawaii uh, next month. So, uh, you know, there, we see tangible signs here of, of real cooperation. Um, I think that though momentum in trilateral cooperation really is crisis driven and I, I certainly see that the recent um, provocations by the North, um, uh, you know, dealing with missile, uh, missile tests and, and nuclear tests has propelled this trilateral cooperation amongst Japan, uh, South Korea and the United States. Um, but I, th I think in the absence of any more um, provocations by the North, we're likely to see uh, trilateral cooperation sort of plateau for the time being. Uh, and I don't see that really change. I don't, I don't foresee uh, major uh, improvements in trilateral uh, coordination or any sort of major breakout agreements, I should say, amongst the three powers uh, in the absence of any sort of major event uh, on the peninsula. Just a few closing thoughts and, and observations. Um, I think trilateralism is beginning to become a proxy for bilateralism. That is, what can't be necessarily achieved bilaterally between South Korea and Japan can now somewhat be uh, achieved in the context of trilateral cooperation with the United States. And the famous example of this was the uh, um, inability for Japan and South Korea to reach an agreement on their um, information sharing uh, mechanism in, in 2012. Uh, this has now been achievable in, in a different guise um, through the TISA, the Trilateral Information Sharing Agreement. Um, the scope, uh, the second sort of observation I make is that the scope and the range and the speed of trilateral cooperation, I would argue, um, depends on South Korean um, willingness. And, and so if you could only imagine the trilateral relationship as a kind of car, um, I would argue that um, it's the United States and Japan that have their foot on the accelerator, on the gas pedal, and it's really South Korea that I would argue, um, fairly or unfairly, has its foot on the, on the brakes. Uh, and, and, uh, so, and I think a lot of this depends, of course, on um, or, or is because of the tensions, the lingering mistrust uh, that exists between uh, Seoul and Tokyo, uh, that is an ongoing issue. But I never, at the, at the end of the day, I do think it's South Korea that, that controls the, the range of cooperation. Um, finally, um, I think that Japan is likely to focus more on this, the US ROK Japan trilateral uh, relationship. Uh, especially now in the wake of the um, debacle that occurred last month uh, with uh, Australia um, uh, deciding to sell or, or, or to give the bid for its submarine, new submarine fleet to France instead of Japan. This has actually really soured Japan-Australia relations. Uh, and in turn, I think this really casts new doubt uh, about the ability for the uh, US, Japan, Australia trilateral uh, um, defense relationship to really go to the next level of engagement. Um, similarly, I think that there's problems with the US, India, Japan trilateral uh, arrangement in that uh, India is, um, I think, still has 
uh, a tradition, a very strong conviction of non-alignment, uh, and its um, um, its interest in uh, in this um, trilateral cooperation is really kind of uh, ebbs and flows. Um, but um, so I, I don't think that Tokyo or Washington can really count on Delhi's uh, full engagement in that trilateral um, sort of a strategic triangle uh, moving forward. So I do think that over that that for the foreseeable future, we'll see the U.S. ROK Japan uh, trilateral um, cooperation really be the focus uh, of Washington and Tokyo um, moving forward. But I do think that my closing sort of thought on this is that. Um, and I do think that the trilateral relationship is only as strong as um, its weakest bilateral link. And certainly the um, Japan ROK relationship remains, uh, there are many gaps that remain. Uh, and so until that really is, is filled, those gaps are filled, I think we'll, um, trilateral, trilateral cooperation will um, have its, its challenges. So I'll leave it with that. So um, I want to turn to um, economic security and relations between Korea, Japan, and the United States. Andrew mentioned uh, the role that institutions play in establishing a new regional order. And I want to spend my five minutes on the role that TPP plays and the potential and limitations of the TPP as a uniting force. Last month in Washington, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, uh, Scott Swift, said that the TPP was the most important U.S. strategy in securing peace and stability in the region. Now, that kind of comment is not new. The most noteworthy one is the fact that the U.S. Defense Secretary, Ashton Carter, said that TPP was as important as um, a single um, U.S. air carrier. Now, of course, TPP is the um, economic arm, or is perceived to be the economic arm of the U.S. rebalance to Asia. And it does represent 12 countries, um, and together they, it represents about 40% of global GDP. It is a framework for establishing economic security at a time when the global economy is facing considerable downside risks, not least the disinte disintegration of uh, the uh, potential for economic um, uh, survival of Europe and the outlook for the Chinese economy as well. But we have to bear in mind TPP is not perfect and it's not a panacea. It isn't perfect because one of the th key things that's missing from it is it hasn't really taken into consideration those who will be left behind as a result of the trade negotiations. And that's actually been a big political um, issue in the United States. And it is to some extent in Japan as well. And should Korea uh, decide to join the TPP, it will also be an issue there, here too. That said, for now, there is a consensus that there is a divergence in um, economic and security realities. So, for example, even at the height of the territorial disputes in the East China Sea, Three years ago, when there were out, um, riots in Beijing against, China, uh, against Japan for nationalizing uh, the Senkaku Daiyu Islands, that was not reflected in the financial market. So whilst there was a lot of diplomatic and um, political anxiety about the tensions between Beijing and Tokyo, Nikkei remained stable. Uh, Shanghai Composite Index was stable, and certainly COPSI did not reflect this. So. This is obviously not the Middle East. We're not seeing a direct correlation between political developments and the financial markets. But the fact of the matter is that this decoupling of security and economic re realities may not necessarily continue to hold true. Now, one of the reasons is because we've, we've discussed already uh, the, the ongoing military diplomatic risks and the return of great power politics and the rise of nationalism across the region. And whilst TPP is seen as a unifier, something that can overcome those obstacles because 
it is an open platform. Unlike a bilateral free trade agreement like CORUS, the US-Korea uh, bilateral free trade agreement, the understanding of TPP is that it is open to everyone. It has 12 member countries right now, but its success lies in its ability to continue to grow and to continue to expand. And it will only become stronger if Korea joins and indeed if the Philippines joins, if the Indonesia and Thailand join as well. And it will bring greater efficiency to trade and it will make it easier for businesses, um, larger scale businesses that do cross-border trade to deal with standardization of rules and not to mention tariff reductions. But does it really provide common values? Is it, is it, can it be something that represents a de facto uh, Asian values? Um, if we are to answer that, we have to take a step back and remember what has led to East Asia's success in the first place. And, what, and that is something that the United States needs to bear in mind as it continues to be and act as a Pacific power. And that key issue is this. It's that the key to regional growth is the lifting of all boats. So when the World Bank released its seminal report entitled The East Asian Miracle, over two decades ago, there, it assessed eight countries that grew, including Japan and Korea. And it gave a lot of analysis on the public policy prescriptions that these countries took to let their GDP growth rate gain, but also how these policies improved welfare and led to more an, a more equitable income distribution. So in a nutshell, economic stability hinges on social stability. And the dirty truth about trade is that trade negotiations invariably lead to losers as well as winners. And there are unintended consequences of trade deals. The ongoing TPP debate in the United States, as well as Japan, and as Korea considers joining TPP, should include, should be more comprehensive, and it should really be about national growth strategy in the most uh, broad range of what that definition can be. So both Japan and the United States really need to provide roadmaps for those who will be left behind as a result of TPP. And they sh their needs should not be dismissed, but it should be taken into account and actually seen as an opportunity for social change, which is at the heart of structural reform. And TPP should be the impetus for structural reform that both Japan and Korea, as well as the United States, needs in the 21st century. Both Tokyo and Seoul can learn from the US struggle in trying to promote TPP to a very reluctant public. And, but that conversation should focus, be as focused on structural reform as much as it is about tariff reduction and standardization of regulations. And looking at this from a trilateral perspective, we should see that this is an opportunity for cooperation as much as it is a source of friction about negotiations to ensure that all sides actually can benefit from this because there are common challenges in new industries. One of the beauties of TPP is that it does give new rules to new agendas, including um, intellectual property rights, including finan uh, financial services to a limited extent, uh, but also to um, dispute mechanisms, environmental protection, standardization of labor standards. These are issues that uh, current members and potential members are heavily invested in or ought to be heavily invested in. But at the same time, they really, it is an opportunity for the three countries to come together to come up with common ways to address common challenges, including the demographic challenge, in, um, energy security, and um, 
really trying to meet the demands of a service-based economy. So thank you very much. So today, Asia is facing both opportunities and challenges from North Korea's uh, continuous nuclear development um, to research and historical and territorial disputes um, to China's rise and its increasing willingness to project its power. There are a number of regional issues that create uncertainties in the region and which makes the robust USROK-Japan trilateral cooperation ever more important in ensuring peace and stability in the region. But there are also st some strategic limits and challenges facing U.S. R.K. Japan trilateral cooperation, and I want to focus more about um, the challenges, particularly in regards to relations with China. There are people who believe that U.S. R.K. Japan trilateral is a useful mechanism to deal with, um, to effectively address growing concerns related to China's um, increasingly assertive foreign policy making. Um, it is necessary for U.S. ROK Japan to um, work together to create an environment that allows for the peaceful rise of China, but using the U.S. ROK Japan trial as a policy tool to deal with China will have some pushbacks and will have some challenges in the future. I say that because um, there seems to be a fundamental gap in the way how countries perceive uh, China's rise, especially between the U.S. and Japan on the one hand, and Korea on the other hand. And also, there's a, as a result of that, there's a misalign misalignment of policy strat um, priorities and strategy regarding China. For the U.S. and Japan, um, while each country is trying to improve their relation with China on their own, they have been working closely together to um, check China's assertiveness and also ensure the current security and economic order. On the other hand, um, the South Korea under current Park administration has pursued active engagement and sometimes even accommodation of China. Um, and as a result, we have seen the U.S.-South um, Korea-China relationship reaching the highest point ever in, the, in their history of the bilateral relations. This differences in um, the country's approach to China, I think, um, has to do with the fundamental differences in how country perceive the rising China. In the case of Japan, especially, there's a serious ongoing uh, territorial dispute between Japan and China about the Senkaku Taiwan issue. But there's um, the, but Japan also see China more as a regional competitor with China's rise and assertiveness as a big challenge to Japan's security and prosperity with the potential to undermine its position in Asia. Um, similar things can be said about, of course, U.S. Um, on a global scale. But on the other hand, also South Korea do share Japan and U.S. concern about China's increasing assertiveness. Um, South Korea do have some fundamental strategic dilemma vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I, I'll say three dilemmas. One is that South Korea is a um, small country and China is big country, giant um, great power that is rising right next door. The sheer differences in the various measured power between South Korea and China, between um, in terms of their population, land size, and military capability shows there's a, f um, there's a fundamental vulnerability that's, and skepticism that South Korea feels about China, but it's also that gives the incentive to South Koreans that they do not want to antagonize China or Want to, uh, want to accommodate China. Um, in addition, South Korea's expanding trade um, relations and increasing economic dependence on China has been a major driving force behind South Korea's continuous efforts to deal, um, to engage with China. Not only did China surpass the U.S. as South Korea's largest trade uh, partner in 2004, but its trade volume with the South Korea has also exceeded South Korea's combined bilateral trade volume with Japan and the U.S. And this has actually led many South Korean public uh, businessmen and also policymakers to believe that South Korea's future, economic future is actually tied to China. Finally, but more importantly, um, South Korea's policy priority is on the resolution of North Korean issues and South Korea desire for unification. And because of that, um, South Korea needs China's cooperation and this des um, desire for China's cooperation map made South Korea extremely cautious and reluctant to join US and 
U.S. and Japan on their efforts to, on the regional and global issues that could antagonize China. The U.S. RK Japan trial relations has suffered in, in the past couple of years, um, largely because of the territorial and historical dispute between South Korea and Japan. But I think that there's fundamental differences in the way how countries see the China and their subsequent policy mismatch actually will have emerged as a potential problem for the trilateral cooperation as the, there's more tensions on the South China Sea and if and as South Korea comes under enormous pressure. Um, so what can be done? Um, I don't have a perfect policy prescription, but then I do have something to, uh, three things to say. One is that understanding South Korea's strategic dilemma vis-a-vis -vis China is critical for the U.S. to manage its alliance with the U South Korea and the South Korea, Japan, and U.S. must address their policy mismatches regarding China and decide, determine how to sustain a coordinated, if not common, strategy. But more importantly, there must be joint efforts and trust-building mechanisms between countries, between Japan, China, and Korea, and the U.S. government should support this. In the end, the tensions and conflict in Northeast Asia and beyond is no, long, no one's interest. Finally, South Korea must understand that there's a danger in its active engagement with China without managing its alliance with the um, U.S., but also with the Japan. And South Korea's alliance um, with the U.S. partnership, U.S. and partners with China does not necessarily have to be mutually exclusive, but South Korea must understand that um, its deep alliance with the U.S. actually strengthens its position as it deals with China. Thank you. Well, thank you to all four of our uh, presenters, and I think we've got plenty of time for questions. I'm actually going to start by asking a first round of questions, one question to each of the presenters, uh, and then I think we will have some time for discussions. So please think about your questions and get ready, because um, I think that uh, we can have a really good discussion uh, based on what has uh, been laid out so far. And so I want to actually go back down to the end and, you know, ask Andrew, um, you talked about the institutional order, you actually talked about the liberal international order in Asia, and it kind of begs the question of against what alternative order? Uh, you know, when you use that phrase, is that a stalking horse for talking about um, targeting China? Or should we interpret that differently? Uh, and what are the prospects for cooperation with China in the context of uh, aspiring to establish a, a framework for liberal, liberal international order in East Asia? And I, I, okay, I guess we, I will ask uh, each question in turn to give our uh, 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 panelists some time to think. Uh, about their answers. Uh, so I'm going to go to uh, Wes next. And uh, he gave, I think, a very interesting presentation with a vivid analogy about gas and brakes. Uh, and, um, you know, there I, I think, uh, you know, it raises some questions about whether everybody's really on the same page. It raises questions about how far can we go in terms of trilateralism. And so I want to ask you, how far do you think is realistic? Uh, one can imagine, um, you know, the, a next step possibly even being like an Asian NATO. Would that be a good idea or a bad idea from your perspective? Uh, and then uh, to Shihoko, I think that, you know, this is really interesting. Um, there's several interesting ideas enmeshed uh, in, in your presentation. One is uh, the relationship of multilateral trade regimes to security. Um, but I think that what I really want to ask you is related to the question of whether or not uh, greater regional integration will really lead to growth. Because especially in Japan and South Korea, you know, that's the major challenge, I think, uh, is how do you gain growth? And so, you know, would a, an established TPP solve the growth problem for Japan and eventually for South Korea? Uh, and, uh, and, and under what conditions might that be uh, possible? Um, and then um, for Ellen, um, 
I think that the question really uh, is, um, you know. No cushion is fine. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to. Much appreciated, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the main things that came out of your presentation is really the uh, issue of uh, the challenge for South Korea uh, in between the United States and China. Uh, and so actually what I'm going to do is to give you a chance to respond to whatever Wes says uh, about uh, the prospects and value of a collective security arrangement uh, and what that would mean in terms of thinking about um, you know, the relationship of a trilateral uh, security cooperation to the challenge of dealing with China. Another way of putting it, or another way, another, I guess, alternative way of asking this would be, um, what sort of preconditions would have to be there to unite the three um, countries uh, in ways that would actually forward their willingness to cooperate given their differences in threat perceptions related to China? So now I presume I've given lots of time for everybody to think about answers. And so I'm going to go back to Andrew and then we'll just come back this direction. Sure. Thanks, Scott, for giving me a few minutes to think about what it is I want to say because I actually did not have liberal international order in my notes and it somehow just slipped out. But uh, I guess that's where my true colors come. <laughs> so the question is, you know, when I say uh, U.S.-Japan-Korea relations helps uphold uh, a liberal institutional order, does that imply that, well, there's another country out there that may want to overturn that liberal order? And of course, that, that country would be, would be China. Um, let me step back and just talk about why the U.S. has been uh, more keen in the past few years about uh, participating in regional institutions, participating in, you know, multilateral uh, forums in Asia. And a lot of it has to do with legitimacy because uh, the U.S. has figured out that uh, it can't just do things uh, all on its own. And if it wants support, um, if, if it wants to uh, play a, a leadership role, that it has to be involved uh, in, in these different multilateral fora, whether you think that they're effective or not. So uh, for the U.S., I mean, it, it really is about it's, you know, the U.S. looks out for its own interests. It's not joining these institutions because uh, it's playing, you know, it wants to be, a, it, be nice, but it, it finds that uh, participating in these uh, organizations, these institutions, uh, helps uh, give it legitimacy within the region. So, uh, so to answer your question, yeah, uh, to answer your question, it is about upholding this liberal international order. Now, whether China wants to challenge that, I mean, that's the real question today, uh, the big question today for uh, Asian uh, international relations. And one thing that the U.S.-Japan-Korea alliance does is that it, it suggests that if you have a strong trilateral relationship um, and if the U.S. is engaged in all these institutions, it's that if you want to challenge um, if you want to challenge this liberal uh, international order, there are many other countries, too, that are part of this order that you would have to append. Um, so I, I, just to talk briefly about Southeast Asia, for instance, it's not that the United States is twisting the arm of Southeast Asian countries to strengthen its uh, defense ties or security ties with the U.S. It's actually uh, uh, countries like Vietnam or Singapore, um, or even Indonesia that are nervous about what's, what's happening with China on the maritime front. So if my personal opinion, if countries had to pick and choose, they, they, don't, they don't pick and choose, they tend to hedge, but if they were to pick and choose, what sort of broader order would you uh, prefer, a, a liberal international one that's led by the U.S. versus something else by China, I still think that they would pick the former. Wes? Uh-oh, my turn. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think of all the questions you asked, this was the most outside the box, and I, I have to admit to be, to being a, a very inside the box thinker. And so, in in uh, in my humble mind, it's very difficult for me to to envision a, a, an Asian NATO uh, anytime soon. But that said, I mean, I, I do think that you know when we think about 
next steps in trilateral defense cooperation, secu security cooperation. We're really talking about sort of incremental baby steps, things like uh, an acquisitions and cross services agreement between Japan and South Korea and AXA, as it's otherwise known. Maybe a bilateral information sharing agreement, a GSAMIA, like uh, what we were trying to achieve in, in 2012. Um, so I think that's the most realistic um, um, route, but um, if I were to try to break out of my uh, intellectual um, prison cell uh, and think more about your, your question, uh, I think that you know we have to be careful about um, thinking about NATO style alliance systems in this corner of the world. Um, you know I think a lot would depend on on the the way um, our relationship with China would evolve over time. Because that kind of a, an alliance system, I think, would very certainly be uh, a signal of some kind of containment of China. Uh, that, to me, is the only rationale for an alliance system that broad. Um, and, and so I, I think we're not there yet, and I think we're doing our best to try not to be at that point uh, in, in the future where, where a NATO, where region-wide U.S.-led alliance system is required. So I would, uh, I would hope that we don't reach that point in the future. And I think there are some actual advantages. The, the current system that we have, which is, um, I think, as Andrew kind of alluded to, is, is kind of a more flexible hubs and spokes system, um, a series of trilateral security arrangements. Um, that are U.S. led, and I actually advocate for. I think that's a very that's a that's a, an appropriate approach. It allows for more flexibility, um, and um, you know, and I, and I think that it allows for um, a less confrontational, um, multilateral front against certain countries in the region. All right. So my question was. Um, Will TPP lead to growth um, in, China, uh, in Korea and Japan or not? And that's a really easy question to answer in some respects because there have been many economists who have done extensive reports about how much this will or will or will not add to GDP. The most um, informative one are studies from the Peterson Institute's um, Peter Petri, um, who's also with Brandeis University, and he estimates that there will be on average about a one percentage point growth in GDP over the next 10 years, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you consider that these countries are growing at about 2 to 3 percent growth rate at best, that's a really high estimate, it is, it is a pretty sizable increase. Um, but the real benefit from um, TPP from a commercial perspective is that it introduces efficiency into the markets. Um, I see TPP as um, really acting as um, the common European market um, equivalent for Asia, and so that you can do cross-border trade, and it does make, for instance, distributors could uh, cut back on red tape um, and a lot of personnel and a lot of lawyers um, and reduce um, cross-border trade by about three to five days. And that's that's quite um, um, a big inc uh, efficiency for smaller size businesses in particular, but also larger size ones as well. But I think the real question here is, what is the cost of not joining TPP? And for that, I believe that um, Japanese Prime Minister Abe gave a very eloquent um, answer when he announced Japan's um, decision to join TPP in 2013, and he said that this is Japan's last chance, essentially, to be an economic power. and. Similarly, I believe this is really the last opportunity that the United States has to be a credible economic Pacific power. Um, these, both um, Japan and Korea are still um, incredibly robust um, economies. Japan is still number two, uh, number three in, in the in the world. But let's face it; these economies have hit a wall, and there is a limit in. Um, how much domestic demand that they can actually muster. And so there is a need for new ways to do business and to carve out new markets and also to meet the needs of their new industries, especially in the services sector. So um, let me talk about 
the complexity of South Korea's perception of China. So we, South Korea and China goes back thousands of years of historical their relationship, but the contemporary relationship, I, I would say the China and South Korea fought during the Korean War, but the South Korean perception of China has been gradually improved um, because of South Korea's strategic need of China on North Korea issues, but also burgeoning economy ties. And given China's leverage on North Korea, um, there has been a growing expectation on, among South Koreans about China's ability, China's willingness to cooperate in North Korea issue. And I think that there was a two incidents in my, in my recent memory that actually that shattered South Korea's expectation about China. One was the, the, in the wake of the Chananam incident, that China actually didn't side, actually pick a side um, with China, uh, North Korea actually. And, and actually that actually really uh, disappointed many South Koreans. And also in 2004, I think China's claim of Kuburyo, South Korea's Kuburyo history as a part of uh, South Korea, uh, China's provincial history actually really angered a lot of South Koreans and there was a really pushback among South Korean public about China. And recently I think that chi there, despite really good, strong relationship between Seoul and Beijing, China's response to North Korea's fourth nuclear test actually, and China's immediate shutdown of strategic communication channel that, re that South Korean government and China actually established actually was shut down. And I think that there is another reality check for South Korea about China's intention about North, Kore um, North Korean issues. Um, so the precondition you ask, I think that um, based on those um, is, is, uh, cases, I think that any attempt by China to um, compromise South Korea's sovereignty about territorial um, cases, I think that will receive a lot of pushback from South Korea, just like Korea incident. And also, um, in any contingency on the Korean Peninsula, whether China will, how China will respond and react, I think that will really actually cause a lot of like, um, uh, will be an, another important precondition for South Korea's willingness to join and, yeah, join. Great. Well, I, uh, I, I want to open the uh, uh, discussion up uh, to our audience. I think we do have a microphone back in the back. I don't know if there's, uh, if we can have somebody bring the microphone up to the front. We've got a couple of questioners in the front. Um, uh, or you can simply speak very loudly. Uh, um, if uh, there we go, uh, we've got two questioners right here next to each other, and I see another one. So we've got a, a queue now. Um, I, why don't we? Uh, I think I'm going to take groups of questions and uh, and allow uh, individuals to respond as uh, required. Uh, so uh, why don't we start here with uh, Dr. Easley? Thank you very much, Scott. Leif Eric Easley, Ihua Women's University and Asan Institute for Policy Studies in Seoul. Um, since I'm getting to ask the first question, allow me to compliment this excellent panel. All the remarks were, were superb, and uh, I really, uh, really appreciated the organization of this. Um, in particular, I want to thank Wes for the specificity of his uh, remarks on trilateral security cooperation. And if you don't mind, I just want to quibble with a couple points and see how you would respond. Uh, to those because I agreed with 98% of what you said, so here's the other 2%. Um, I think that the disappointment over the Australian sub deal is being exaggerated a little bit. Uh, I think that, you know, this in, in hindsight will be seen as the Japanese first foyer or, or entrance into the global uh, uh, defense uh, procurement uh, and alliance arms deals uh, coordinated procurement world, uh, and it won't be seen as a major blow to Japan-Australia cooperation or trilateral uh, strategic cooperation with the United States. So if you could elaborate a little bit on, on that. I think Yuan Graham uh, from the Lowy Institute has written a couple good articles about this that I would, I would commend. Um, and uh, to Shihoko, uh, 
I, I thought this was great on, on a TPP, uh, being more inclusive. I hope that Korea can join as soon as possible. Uh, what about Taiwan uh, is my, my question uh, to you. Uh, to Ellen, um, should there be a trilateral voice on the South China Sea? And, and finally, uh, to Andrew, we have uh, President Obama visiting Hiroshima today. Uh, in your view, as someone who's studied the domestic politics very carefully, um, do you see this as something that could be um, antagonizing of history issues in the region? Uh, or rather, are you more optimistic? Do you see it as a possible uh, uh, impetus for a virtuous cycle of reconciliation? Uh, because I think it's not going to be the last high-level visit to an a important historical uh, site. Uh, or do you think it's, it's not going to have much effect on, on trilateral relations? I'd be very interested in all of your views. Thank you very much. And uh, you're not required to ask a question to every panelist, uh, but uh, John, why don't you go next uh, with a question? John, did you have a question? No? Okay, then right over here uh, in the, uh, on the far side. I'll go without the microphone. Uh, uh, they might need I it for the they, translation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, hello. Um, hi, my name is Corey Morgan. I'm a Fulbright Scholar. I live here on Jeju Island. Um, my question is, I'm going to lob it to everybody. Um, Corey, uh, Corey, Corey, Corey Hose, Korea Hose, and depends on the USA and its military, and therefore shares a special security relationship. At the same time, its economic ties are only strengthening with China, and I'm thinking the uh, Asian International um, Investment Bank. Um, specifically, the US is very unhappy about Korea joining that, and they haven't joined the TPP yet. Um, is this a zero-sum game? Does this strengthening relationship necessarily mean the nature of the security relationship will also change? And that's it. Okay, um, I think we'll uh, go back to our panelists for now and uh, maybe start with Ellen and we'll go down since everybody got a question from Leif and then also please answer about uh, the uh, respective Korean relationships with the US and China. Are they zero-sum? Where's the convergence? Uh, uh, you know, what are the conditions essentially under which it's possible for Korea to maintain this um, kind of uh, balance between dependence on the U.S. for security and dependence on China for economic growth? So. The AIB issue, very interesting case. When the AIB cash issue arise um, in last March 2014, there's another is important issue which was a uh, thought. And there's, there's a rush of like government official from US and China at the same time to chi uh, South Korea to hold discussion about their respective issues. And it was seen by outsider as a tug of war uh, South Korea going through between, South Korea, uh, between US and China. And in the end, it, on the AIB issue, the UK's action to join AIB was a, gave a lot of political cover for not just South Korea, but Australia and, and many other countries. And I actually did some preliminary research on AIB issue and whether um, economic dependence on China is a big factor in countries joining of AIB. And there's actually statistical significance of countries' dependence on China, economic dependence on China, with the country's participation uh, AIB. So, um, on the mutual exclusivity of the relationship itself, what you well, it remains. Uh, there's a lot of like complex interests that South Korea has, be but the in the end, South Korea I think do not want to get caught in between U.S. and China interests, and I think that's pretty much the same for many other countries, um, even many countries in the South China, um, South East Asia. They, some of them face actually direct conf um, confrontation with uh, uh, as real, um, because of the, um, on their South China Sea issue, but they are the one actually who joined the AIB at the even all, even before UK decided to join. So there's a lot of like hedging behavior countries in response to rising China, and I think it's hard to tell, um, yeah about the mutual exclusive, I think, but South Korea needs some diplomatic finance to deal with 
how to manage the relationship between U.S. and China. Taiwan. Um, I was actually in Taiwan last month, um, and I met with um, members of the now new um, DPP government's um, elected officials. There was a lot of concern about um, Taiwan not being able to join TPP, um, particularly because it sees itself as a great rival to Korea. And if Korea were to join and Taiwan were not, then Taiwan would be put in a very precarious situation. So certainly the current Taiwanese strategy is to ensure that Taiwan too could, could join TPP when, when and if Korea does as well. That is a very difficult situation given Taiwan's unique political standing in, as, as, a, as a country, as a government. And what had happened in, with Taiwan joining the WTO in 1990 was that both China and Taiwan had to join WTO together. And there is concern in Taipei right now that this will be the case for TPP as well. But if that is the case, then China perhaps maybe down the line may be able to join TPP, but it would be a long time waiting. And if Taiwan were to wait that long until China was succession ready, then the Taiwan, Taiwanese economy would actually be in a much weaker state than it is today. Um, that said, the current um, the Democratic Progressive Party uh, president, Tsai Ing-wen, will probably make it very clear that Taiwan wants to join now. And the United States has made clear that it really will not be able to accept Taiwan. And Japan has been pushing very much for Taiwan to join. Um, on AIIB, this is a similar situation as well, where, uh, where um, Taiwan actually wanted to join TPP, uh, AIIB, and it was rejected by Beijing, not because it wasn't um, uh, meeting the necessary requirements to join AIIB, but because of the way it called itself, and I'm trying to remember, um, it is, um, Taiwan officially goes by the um, ROC, Republic of China, but it wanted to go with that name, but China said that it should be... Chinese it? Taipei? Chinese Taipei? Really sure. Yeah, so, and, and that was just a non-negotiable situation, so it was unable to join AIIB at that time. Um, regarding um, the United States, um, just to add to Ellen's point on AIIB is that Given that the United States hasn't even paid up its dues um, for the IMF, it's high, highly unlikely that the current U.S. Congress or the future U.S. Congresses would actually um, approve um, any joining of uh, the U.S. government into the AIIB. So that's, that's difficult. And with regards to Japan and AIIB, the question is, you know, will AIIB usurp the place of ADB? And ADB is very much Japan's baby, so you don't want to treat your kid that badly. So, but if you look at that, and you look at the, how the United States and Japan, and under their own unique circumstances, are choosing not to join AIIB, it has little to do with how it sees Korea, and it, it, there is no hostility towards Korea's decision to join AIIB. Thank you, Leigh, for your, your question. And I, I actually, I agree with you. I mean, I think it's easy to, to make this whole submarine um, issue really overblown and to, and to think, uh, you know, gloom and well, gloom will, will last forever. But I do think that in the short term, um, you know, this, this really turned out really badly for both sides. And I do think that there's actually... Um, really actually pretty bad blood right now. Um, at least that's, the, that's what I've heard, uh, and especially from Japanese defense um, officials, is that um, you know, they, there's, there's great mistrust now for their uh, Australian counterparts, and they don't even want to talk at this point about strategic issues with their Australian counterparts. Um, I don't expect that to last forever and ever, um, but I do think that right in the immediate wake of what happened, um, I, I do think that um, you know there, there's a lot of uh, bitter bitterness in the, la the mouths of, of uh, those involved. 
Um, but I do think that strategic, you know, priorities will emerge over time that will, you know, uh, necessitate more dialogue and, and greater trilateral cooperation over the long term or medi even medium term. But good, I, I, I think that's a good point and, and one that I should have mentioned. I'll be quick because I want to hear more questions. But on the uh, Obama, President Obama's visit to Hiroshima, I'm, I mean, I'm here now and I don't have Wi Fi, so I can't read up what's going on real time. But uh, I actually am quite positive about it. And I, I don't know if it's going to trigger a virtuous cycle, but in the short term, at least, it's going to give Washington a little bit of political capital, um, I think, over Japan on these some of these hist hist uh, historical issues. And I do think what's lost, especially in Korea sometimes, is just, uh, I guess, the narrative within Japan that you know Japan also sees itself as a victim of World War II because of of uh, the atomic bomb droppings and um, the fact that the U.S. of course the U.S. is implicated in in a lot of these historical issues as well too. But the fact that uh, the president is coming on an official visit to Hiroshima, I think that to me, I think that that's actually something that can be seen uh, positively in terms of trying to talk more openly about these historical issues. Okay, we're ready for a uh, second round of questions. Uh, and I've got uh, one over here, uh, Carl Friedhoff. Um, and also I wanna encourage, uh, we've got some Korean students here in the audience. We do have uh, interpretation capability. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to get uh, some Korean students to ask a question. Don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, actually, Carl, you've... Go ahead. Uh, Carl Friedhoff with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. My question is for Shihoko. Um, you, you began your presentation with that, that quote from, from Scott Swift, and then Scott Snyder alluded to kind of the, the tie between to trade agreements and economics and security. So I know that there is a division between security and politics, but one of the distinct features of Asia is that the economies kind of hum on and they do a fairly good job, the countries do, of not letting politics interfere with business. And I'm wondering how the U.S. has started to sell this as kind of, you know, being such an important agreement for not only the economics, but also the security that if we're starting to pass kind of a golden time where the countries were able to keep them separate, but now the U.S. is opening the door to allow those security and politics to start to intervene. So just about the framing of how the U.S. is trying to, to approach this and kind of do the PR for the deal. So your thoughts on that. Okay. 학생들 중에 누가 질문 있어요? Okay, well, we're, we'll come back to you. Uh, I'll give Shihoko a chance, but please ask a question. So. Go ahead. Um, the, the beauty of democracy is also its weakness. And it's, we have not had, uh, since um, TPP was uh, concluded um, last year, there have been no hearings on TPP on the Hill. Um, the political timing right now is that the wishful thinkers hope that there will be some kind of um, ability to ratify uh, before the end of the year, but quite frankly, time is not on their side. I talk about the, weak, the frailties of, of democracies because at the end of the day, this is a legislation that has to be passed by members of Congress. And they are beholden, their allegiance, of course, is to the United States of America, but at the same time, they really want to stay in power, stay in office. And if they go back to their respective constituencies and say that they voted for TPP, a lot of them will face a lot of um, trouble. For instance, I was talking to a member from a southern state um, that is heavily invested in shrimping. And the TPP will actually compete head on with shrimpers from Vietnam and his constituents will essentially be unemployed. Um, I talked about this in my, in my opening remarks about the need for um, you know, accommodating the losers. And there are mechanisms that the United States government offers federal programs like the Federal Assistance uh, Program, but 
they're not enough and there isn't really, the, there's a disconnect between you know, what the national priorities are. This is a security issue. This is a uh, US national strategic interest to have TPP put through so that the United States can remain a Pacific power in the world's most um, populous and, and most dynamic region on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have members who are very beholden to their electorate and it's very difficult for them to reconcile one another. The White House has actually not been terribly, they, they have been promoting uh, TPP um, a great deal, but it doesn't really address, it doesn't give ammunition to those um, members who are from um, vulnerable states. And interestingly enough, um, the Japanese embassy and other embassies, uh, the Peruvian embassy, uh, the Canadian embassy, the ambassadors and political counselors, economic counselors from those countries have gone on a road show across the United States trying to talk up and say, this will help your state do business in Japan or Peru or Canada. And that has a limited impact, but of course they're not really going to those hot zones where that argument doesn't hold. So. It's difficult. I forgot to answer Professor Easley's question. Um, so he asked me about sh um, whether, sh whether there should be a trilateral voice on South China Sea issue, right? Um, if I uh, were a um, South Korean policymaker, I would say this, that we'll, hold, we'll wait until June this year when we have uh, sanctions results on China. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I do want some additional questions, uh, especially any students who want to ask a question. By the way, you know, I'm the moderator, so I can extend the session <laughs> as long as I want uh, until someone has the courage to ask a question. Uh, but we don't want to force anybody. Oh, uh, oh, oh, we've got one over here. Okay. Yes. No, no, you can ask him. Uh, uh, <laughs> <웃음> 그 지금까지 T, TPP 한국의 TPP 가입을 계속 그 추천해 주셨는데 그 지금까지 한국이 TPP를 가입하지 않는 이유와 그리고 TPP를 가입했을 때의 단점을 알고 싶고요. 그리고 그 옆에 있는 친구가 대신 질문해 달라고 했는데 <웃음> 한국의 TPP 가입에 대한 한미 FTA에 대한 한미 FTA에 대한 생각을 듣고 싶답니다. <laughs> well, thank you for the question and f for acting on behalf of your friend as well. You're a good friend. <laughs> the we actually, our group has been traveling in Korea from earlier this week, and one question that I asked um, a government official was exactly, oh no, a former uh, trade negotiator for the Korean government was exactly what you just asked me now. Um, why isn't Korea already part of TPP? And why, when and how can it join? Now, uh, the decision for Korea not to join TPP is obviously a domestic one, but if I were to echo that trade negotiator's comment, um, it was just really kind of bad timing. Um, there was a restructuring of the government so that the responsibilities of um, trade negotiations move from one ministry to another was one issue. And the other one was that CHORUS, the US-Korea um, bilateral free trade agreement had just been signed and it really needed to settle down um, and be looked through before 
Korea was prepared to uh, enter into a, a new trade negotiation. I also think there is a third element, which is that I don't think Korea expected Japan to join. And the decision for Japan to join in the spring of 2013 really made TPP a, a much bigger the deal than it had been until then. So that's water under the bridge. What about Korea now? Um, I do think it's in Korea's interest to join. Um, it is more difficult, it, it does put Korea at a somewhat disadvantageous position because it is not a founding member, which means that it has to accept all of the conditions that have already been accepted by the founding members, which are non-negotiable. There will be additional negotiations between Korea and the 11, uh, the 12 member countries as well. And I believe the Korea media, Korean media in particular has been concerned about um, Japan being particularly um, uh, more difficult, especially on the agriculture front, in accepting, um, in, in terms of allowing Korea to join the TPP. So, but this is, we don't know if TPP is going to go through. I mean, we're, we're talking about, my, my own understanding of this is that it will go through, but not under this current president, but on, in a new session, but we don't know who the new president will be. And one president in particular has been extremely against TPP, um, candidate, I should say. The other candidate, whilst she was instrumental in promoting TPP um, at the negotiating stage has denounced it uh, on the campaign trail. So we do not know whether the United, how this will pan out in the United States. The interest for Korea as, as a result, I believe, is that it should continue with reform, structural reform in particular, that would, it would have to embrace if it were to go to become a TPP member. And I think that it is already well on its way because it has adopted chorus. But there are other things, um, things that would make Korea very competitive in the 21st century um, in terms of diversifying its corporate um, structure, diversifying its industries, um, educating um, young people who will be um, very competitive and attractive in a global market. Those are the things that I think would be to the advantage of Korea in the long run. We're, we're coming to the end of our time. I do want to have any additional questioners, if there, uh, especially, I've got one more student here. Actually, I've got several people here. We've got lots of questions, so uh, right here and right here. Yeah,安녕하세요.저는조선대학교정치외교학과에재학중인황소미라고하는데요.제가앞부분을사실잘조금놓친부분이있어서이부분에대한언급이됐었는지는잘모르겠지만새로운동북아시아안보질서형성에
Russia actually can contribute to the kind of peace or sustainable peace and an economic growth in this region. Thank you. Okay, we have two additional questions, and actually one of them is very fundamental. Uh, if I were going to rephrase the first question, it is basically, do we have to settle the past in order to shape the future? Uh, and I'd like to get, you know, the panelists each a chance to uh, answer uh, that question, and then the Russia question, whoever wants to catch the ball, please feel free. Um, Ellen, why don't I start with you, and we'll move down the opposite way. So I understand the question was asking whether how we whether we should separate the historical issue from the the security the the right was the secure history issue it was huh? politics um I'll say that it's necessary it's necessary and in, it's in country's interest to to think pragmatic and there are a number of issues that actually emerges every single day. And as we know, that North Korea provokes pretty much like sporadically. And we need, uh, South Korea cannot deal with this issue by itself, and we need cooperation from other countries. So I'll say that country needs to think sometimes pragmatically. And I think that you, it was the, this, this idea was the central in the, you, um, the thinking be, uh, be in South Korean government and also Japanese government about their, the way they approach this historical issue. So. I'm not a historian, um, but at the same time, um, I think it was Kissinger who said that history is too important to be left to historians. Um, there is the politicization of historical memory is playing a great role in diplomacy and it's playing a great a role in politics as well. And it is not for me to judge whether that is good or bad, but my belief, my strong, unshakable belief is that we do need to um, be more compassionate and perhaps there is a lack of um, empathy um, on, on all sides. Um, and I do think that forms like this that encourage young people to participate and to want to understand and hopefully to understand the other side's perspective is an invaluable one. And this is not an answer to your question, but it's more a reflection of my hope. Thanks. You know, I'm, I'm an American and I suffer from um, a symptom that I think a lot of my compatriots suffer from, which is when we look at problems, uh, historical problems in this corner of the world, we tend, to, uh, we tend to have an impatient expectation that people just get over their differences, that there are much bigger strategic issues at play. Can't you just forget about things and move on? I, I think that's actually quite unreasonable. Uh, I think the um, the damage um, that was done uh, years ago um, was never adequately addressed, um, and I think that um, the I, f I find it very unfortunate, particularly in the, in the case of the Japan uh, Korea uh, situation, that ties were normalized in 1965. Um, so that's, uh, you know, 20 years uh, after the uh, close of hostilities, official close of hostilities at the end of World War II. Um, that was 20 years in which feelings were basically left to fester. Uh, that's basically 20 years in which, um, you know, sentiments were allowed to um, grow more and more bitter. Uh, and 20 years in which Japan was not really uh, addressing uh, the, um, the, um, the issues of its history as it related to Korea. So uh, I think um, there's a, there, you know, this is a very complex issue, and I am all for actually reconciling some of these things. They will never be completely <coughs> resolved. Uh, I think we need to be realistic about that. Um, but we do need to heal. 
Uh, and I do think that that will provide the foundation for moving forward on, on deeper and more substantial political relations in the future. Andrew? Just quickly on the Russia question, because no one's addressed it. Um, I think things could help if Russia <laughs> would uh, help resolve ish the Ukraine issue, for instance. I think Russia doesn't have a lot of, of capital these days just because of the way Russia is uh, commanding its own foreign policy future. But at the same time, Russia is a part of Northeast, uh, Northeast Asia, and um, they've kind of been boxed out of the whole you know, uh, North Korea um, you know, the denuclearization issue, but, you know, if, again, if for this nuclear, uh, for the North Korean nuclear uh, issue to be resolved, I do think that it has to be multilateral and Russia, uh, Russia does have to be a part of this conversation. And finally, on the, on the question about uh, putting history on a separate track from other security issues in the region, I mean, I think the other panelists were very eloquent in what they had to say, so I, I don't think I'm throwing uh, anything out there that's new. But, um, but I would say that I, I do think that you can have, it, it, this goes back to Ellen's comment, but you can be pragmatic about some of the security, some of the functional issues that are in place. I mean, for instance, you, we do see uh, cooperation between US, Japan, and Korea, even though there are these outstanding historical issues. Um, so it is possible to talk about um, security, uh, economic cooperation without always bringing in history. But at the same time, I do think that unless there is uh, ongoing dialogue about some of these uh, historical disputes, uh, historical tension, it's, uh, it's going to continue to plague, um, plague uh, Northeast Asia relations. And the sad thing is it's, it's really, it, it may not never be resolved because uh, history is often a matter of perspective and you can't get the other to always see the same thing that you do. I think what the unfortunate thing is that oftentimes politicians are using history or they play the nationalist card for their own short-term gains. But I do think that if there is ongoing dialogue, if there is ongoing discussion, if there's a willingness to try to understand the other, um, then you can move forward. And because we are on Jeju Island, I actually did a lot of research uh, related to actually the, the Jeju Naval Base, but I got to learn a bit about the history of Jeju and the uh, you know, the Sasam Sakon, the 4-3 uh, massacre. And you know, these are issues that, for instance, a lot of people back in the United States or America don't know. And so as Weston mentioned, when I say that countries should try to understand, um, you know, the other and understand what, uh, where their uh, views are coming from, it also, it's also with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also speaking about uh, Americans uh, back in the United States as well too, because I think there's uh, a lot of ignorance even uh, on the part of, of Americans and even U.S. policymakers. Okay, well, unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. I'm going to draw the panel to a close, <laughs> although I think we probably could have continued for another couple of hours. Um, I want to thank the audience uh, and especially the students for their participation and I also want to invite you to thank our panelists for leading us in this discussion. Thank you.